Okay, welcome back. So we're looking at now this resurgence and this personal reflection of this moment through Our Lady of Perpetual Health. And we see here now that this is the one moment the priest looks most to Mary for her intercession. In the life of every priest, he sees the crucifix before him and can hear once again his Lord saying to him, this is thy mother. Their representative of her divine son now sees the glory of St. John who loves Jesus and now understands that he too must love as Jesus loved because revelations made by the Sacred Heart to saintly souls indicate that still unexplored depths of that heart are reserved for priests. There are veils of love behind which only the priest may penetrate and from which he will emerge with a power over souls far beyond his own strength. That is why in this time of crisis and this abuse, those that have been hurt, they have been hurt by ones whom they trusted. And when you're hurt by one whom you trust, then there is a breakdown of trust. Just like in a marriage. Husband beats his wife, she don't trust him anymore. Comes close to her, stay away from me. So that trust and the bond of love is gone. And so we have to understand this crisis in that same reality that not only the victims were hurt, who suffered horrifically at the hands of these cruel priests and bishops, but we, the faithful, and the loyal priests, because of the sense of trust, who knows? One of those priests could have been stationed with a priest that did these things. Or may have worked for a bishop who did these things, as now they're questioning those that were under McCarrick. They don't know where he went. I mean, you know, you don't question somebody, you know, where are you going now? Where are you going here? Why are you going there? They figured he's the bishop, he can do what he wants. So he's figuring he's going out somewhere, maybe visiting a school or something. Who knew the undercurrent? So there is that sense of now that hurt and pain which spreads like fire within the very depths of the church. That is why we have to look once again to Calvary, and in this chaplet it says, through thy precious blood, cleanse. That's what is occurring, the cleansing. And like St. John, the priest now must be close to the cross. Because we have to pick up now the remnant And the laity. So the crosses the priest is picking up is not only that of the fallen priests, but he's picking up the crosses of those who are hurting in pain. And he's picking up the cross of his own parishioners. He's picking up the cross of those he ministers to. And he's picking up the cross 
even for his bishop. So he's got to be another Simon of Cyrene. Picking up the cross and following Jesus in this pain and sorrow that has hurt Christ and his church. So he walks the journey. And so what he must do is find that strength and on page 19 of your text, December the 11th, 2007, it was a Tuesday. Prayer is an essential part of every priest's life. The rosary is his weapon against the evil one to defend that only himself from evil, but to pray for the laity entrusted to his care. The rosary is that spiritual help that he needs to safeguard his flock. When you read those pages, and page 19 especially, the rosary, the Salve Regina, are mentioned there. Thus, through Mary's example and influence, there comes a moment in the priest's life when he recognizes that he does not belong to his family, his parish, his diocese, his country. He belongs to the missions into the world which he belongs to humanity. He belongs to everyone. The closer the priest gets to the mission of Christ, the more he loves every soul in the world. As Mary mothered all men at the cross, so the priest fathers them. So you see now the task that is involved here for the loyal priests. It's a tremendous task. He has to be now a father to all of them, the hurting, the suffering, his parish, those that have left his church and left empty pews, trying to get them back, to make them understand, to rebuild from the remnant that is left. That unity and trust once again. No bishop is consecrated for a diocese. He is consecrated for the world. Go back to the upper room. Go back to Pentecost. What was the mission? The day of ascension. Go to all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You know, Venerable Bishop Sheen, when he was the head of the propagation of faith, didn't stay in New York. He went out to the missions. You see the photographs of him. He went to Africa to see the poor and the suffering children. He went to different parts of Asia. He went to China, Japan. He ministered as did the early apostles. He went to his brother bishops in those countries to tend to their needs, their wants, to invite them to come here. And he saw the suffering church. 
that needed help. That is why when St. John Paul II came to our nation's capital, to the shrine of the Blessed Mother, and Bishop Sheen was there, the two embraced. And he said, you have done well and have done much good for the church. For you are a loyal son of the church. That's the mission of a bishop. Bishops travel to the parishes in their diocese. Our beloved bishop goes to every parish in the diocese to check his flock, to embrace them, to see if they're hurting. Tell me what your needs are. Even in his suffering, even though he's fully recovered, one does not fully recover and bounce back right away. But he's doing it to ensure the flock to be reunited and rebuild and strengthen the diocese. You see, that's the task that Mary is speaking of here for her priests and bishops and the laity. He is assigned to a diocese for juridical reasons, a bishop. The priests are not designed just for a diocese, but they are designed for all souls whom they encounter. Once again, going back to Bishop Sheen, one time he was on an airplane. A lady sits down next to him, and she begins to convert. She's not a Catholic, and she sees his cross. And she says, um, that cross you wear, tell me what it's about. And he began to converse with her. And when they got off the plane in New York, she says, can I come and talk to you? And he said, yes, you can. And she went to see him and became a convert to the faith. So the mission speaks for itself. When one is loyal and true, people see that. They know it. They feel it. They sense it. And so they grab hold of the cross. And they want to know more. So the same with priests now. They've got to take the cross and hold it up to reassure, rebuild and through the loyalty of the priesthood and of our bishops that are true and faithful, the church will go forward with the help of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. At Cana, Mary is given to humanity. At the foot of the cross, she is confirmed as the mother of mankind. So to the priest and bishop, I am your mother, the mother of mercy. Now this was said also to St. Faustina, if you read her diary. When our Blessed Lady appeared to Faustina one night, I am the mother of mercy. Honored by the church in her chant to me, which is the Salve Regina. When a priest dies, the very last hymn, when he is carried out of the church, is Salve Regina, sung by his brother priests. And then, when he is interred, the final hymn to the Blessed Mother. So there is that connection 
of loyalty to Mary. My dear sons, persevere in your praying to me. Devotion to Mary keeps a priest from being a hired servant with fixed hours, parish limits, assigned duties, and no lost sheep. There is no on duty for the priest. As our Blessed Mother indicates to the Holy Monk, a priest is love everywhere on duty. So in other words, you call the rectory. And I know because I've experienced it, people told me. They'll call one rectory, is Father there, we need a priest. No, he's not. Okay, call another rectory. Is Father there? Oh, he can't be disturbed now. Well, this is a hospital calling. Well, can you see if you can get somebody else? You've experienced it. And it goes right down the line until somebody who is faithful answers the phone and says, it could be 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. I've done it many times. Get a call, 2, 3 in the morning. This is Altman Hospital calling. We can't get a priest. Can you come? I'll be there. Or when I was in Louisville, they would call. We can't get a priest. 4 o'clock in the morning, Alliance Hospital. There was an accident. Uh, the family wants a priest. Okay, I'll be there. That's your job. And it's not a job, it's a mission. It's a vocation that you have chosen. You have embraced the cross. You have taken up the cross. Your child is hurting. And so you go. It's Jesus calling. That's why when Jesus went down the mountain, <laughs> at the Mount of Olives, he says to the apostles, they were asleep, can't you not watch and pray with me one hour? He was calling them to the hour that they will have to one day get up and go to the laity, to their children, anoint them in the name of the Lord, bury the dead, Bring viaticum. Comfort the sorrowful. This is what Our Lady is saying. This has got to happen now when we rebuild the church. The loyalty of the priest must be understood. That no matter, there's no fixed hours. Sure, he may be tired. I was tired many times. Teaching school, running a parish, taking care of a nursing home, then going back to the rectory. Phone would ring. You got a problem at the high school. Okay, I'll be there. Phone would ring again. And we need a priest to come to Altoona Hospital. Okay, I'll be there. You did it. Even though you may have been tired, but you did it. You did it for Christ. You don't do it for yourself or pass the buck. Now, it's one thing if you're sick. But what Our Lady is saying here, this devotion, this loyalty must be understood. And that's where these fellows didn't understand that, that abused these young people. They had their own agenda. And that agenda did not include the good people. It included what they wanted. And now, the crosses have to be picked up by the faithful priests. And they have to understand now, there is no, even though the sign on the church office says, nine to three. All right, that's for the secretaries and help. But for the priest, there is no nine to three. It's 24 hours, seven days a week. Ask.
at the cross. Once again, I point out in that film, The Shoes of the Fisherman, when that individual that played Cardinal Leone said to Anthony Quinn, this is Calvary and you have only begun the climb. That's the mission now of the faithful priests, loyal to the church, loyal to their vows, that now they are climbing Calvary. And along the way, they have to pick up the pieces and rebuild the souls of the just into trust. As our Blessed Mother indicates to the Holy Monk, this love has to be everywhere. My son, I bless your preaching in your writing, she tells him. I give you the gift of touching many hearts and winning them for me, especially priests. Trust me for unfolding the plan of my son. I will see to every detail. It is I who obtain this calling for you. You will be the priest, the otter obtained by my heart for this work, so desired by my son. Jesus is crying out to his priests. Even before this. Were there tags on the doors that said, priest here nine to five, don't call me after that? We're not bankers. We're like doctors. We're physicians of the soul. You call a doctor... You need a surgeon right away at the hospital. They call a surgeon. He comes. Could be two, three, four, five in the morning. You are a father and a father's son. You got it right there. Just as she said right there in, that, in those pages. You're calling your father. Did not a pagan soldier do that to Jesus? Along the road, Jesus is walking. Here comes a centurion. Sir, my daughter is sick. Please, can you come? Your, your daughter, yes, I'll come. And a, a messenger comes and says she is dead. And Jesus says to him, your daughter is not dead. She is only asleep. And Jesus goes. <clears throat> or the man, the man that wanted to see Jesus. He's crying out. So what do they do? They want him to see Jesus. Jesus is there. They open up the roof, bring him down on a mat. Jesus heals him. The woman, as Jesus is walking along the road, that comes up behind him. Someone has touched my tassel. Who is it? He turns around. She's healed. That's the mission. That's the work. That's what Our Lady is telling this holy monk, that this is going to be what has to come out of the remnant to rebuild the church. The strength of the heart. And she says, especially priests, trust me. Trust me. For unfolding the plan of my son, I will see to every detail. It is I who obtain this calling for you. You will be the priest close to my heart in the rebuilding. Of the rock of Peter. She knows what's happening. She told us it was going to happen. She warned us what we had to do. She gave us the weapon. The children didn't listen to their mother. And when you don't listen to your mother, you're punished. And so now we are suffering. But she did not abandon. 
She's rebuilding and strengthening not only her children, the laity, but her sons for her son. So we're going to leave it there and we'll pick up there next time. And I want to close with this beautiful prayer to St. Benedict, which I think is appropriate because of the Benedictine monk. Dear St. Benedict, you are a blessing. Indeed, as your name indicates, practicing what you preached, you founded the monastic tradition of the West by joining prayer to labor for God, both liturgical and private prayer. Help all religious to follow their rule, to be true to their vocation. May they labor and pray for the world to the greater glory of God. Amen. 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 God our Father, you made St. Benedict an outstanding guide to teach men how to live in your service. Grant that by preferring your love to everything else, we may walk in the way of your commandments. Amen.